Besides Calgary 2022, forecast is calling for clouds. Now I wanna highlight that cloud service providers inherently provide security capabilities, allowing us to turn them on and leverage them right from the beginning. The challenge comes with the complexity of these cloud service providers and all the other environments that we have to manage. And I'm gonna highlight this here, but again, cloud service providers provide tremendous opportunity to enhance security. Now we've got some complexity here because we've got multi-cloud environment or a multi-IT environment where we've got AWS, we've got Azure, we've got Google, we have Oracle and many more on top of that. Now AWS and Azure are certainly prevalent in Canada, but we also have things like private cloud or traditional data centers. We've got Kubernetes or container-based microservices uh, all add some complexity here. So I just want to call that out, even though they can be deployed in any environment. And so we're going to dig into a couple of these cloud service providers. And again, we're calling out a lot of great capabilities that they offer. The problem is, is how do you manage this at scale across the entire ecosystem of capabilities that you're providing your customers, the business, the consumers, so let's drill into this. A lot of the cloud service providers provide a blueprint around the security elements that you could add to your virtual cloud environment. And we're gonna go through some of these here. So AWS CloudTrail is really a service that helps with governance, compliance, operational auditing, and risk auditing of your AWS account. So it monitors and retain account activity related to actions across that AWS infrastructure. And here's an example of that. So if, if a user tries to start an EC2 instance, which is a virtual machine within the AWS environment, that's gonna be logged. Now, if an adversary does that, that's interesting, right? That's something that you do want logged if they're gonna fire up an EC2 instance uh, and use it for malicious purposes. There's two issues there. One is how do they get access? And two is they're probably gonna be using that instance for nefarious reasons. And so CloudTrail can help monitor that type of activity. Amazon Event Bridge. Now this is a serverless event bus that allows you to filter, transform, route, and deliver events. It's It can be used in security automation and it's event-driven architectures. You, you hear more and more about this. For example, you have Security Hub, we'll talk about that shortly, imported events that are sent from Security Hub to EventBridge and use the following format. So you can see here we have a Security Hub findings that's been imported. It talks about the account, the time, the region, the resource, and the findings. The beauty here is I can take in all these different sources into EventBridge, go through it, run rules against it, and, and drive specific outcomes whether that be a notification or an automated response. Amazon Guard Duty. So this is threat detection service that continuously monitors for malicious activity of unauthorized behavior. Now this captures and stores appropriate logs for monitoring things from AWS CloudTrail, VPC flow logs, which is similar to NetFlow or IP fix data uh, in the cloud environment. And then you have AWS uh, DNS logs as well. I've always said it's critically important that you take and centralize logging information such as DNS, whether you're using a cloud service provider, whether you're on premise, whether you're uh, at a coffee shop working away, you want to make sure that you're capturing all DNS uh, requests from all assets. Same thing with flow data, whether again, if you're at the coffee shop, I should be picking up IP fix data. I should be getting net flow from my campus environment. I, and I should be getting uh, VPC flow logs or NSG flow logs from Azure uh, and, and centralizing those logs as, as well as files, right? Because what you want to have is the ability to be able to go to a central source that contains the data that you need when you're investigating. And so this is going to help us detect things like reconnaissance, account compromise, incident compromise and bucket compromise. Bucket, for those that may not be aware, is uh, the storage backend. Uh, they call it a bucket where you can save your files. AWS Security Hub. So this provides a comprehensive view of security within AWS. Uh, you can run this against industry standards and best practices. This is all good stuff. 
AWS collects uh, data from uh, integrated services, third-party products, and custom security products as well. And they come with nine best practices. And I'm not really here to go through any best practices. What I'm here to suggest is that there's some complexity here. And so every one of these services, I would assume, would come with best practices. And then as practitioners, it becomes very challenging for us to be able to understand all of these nuances between all these different ways of doing things and making sure that we're providing effective security defense for the things that we're protecting. We know that we have a, a significant challenge around cybersecurity skill sets. AWS Firewall Manager, this is neat in the sense that allows you to manage and maintain AWS Web Application Firewall, their AWS DDoS capabilities, their VPC security groups, Network Firewall, Route 53, then that's DNS Resolver, and having the ability to drive outcomes from a single manager and integrate with things like uh, AWS Security Hub, where we can centralize and export uh, compliance findings, et cetera. So again, trying to simplify a lot of the complexity around all the different control points that you might have in the environment, but there's a lot of them. So Amazon Detective supports the response of security control strategy by making it easy to analyze, investigate, and quickly identify root cause. So you can see things like login attempts, API calls, network traffic uh, from AWS CloudTrail, and VPC flow logs. So you can see that there's a, there's a bunch of capabilities that are using a lot of the similar sources uh, and providing uh, di maybe different perspectives and outcomes. So if, for example, you have Amazon Detective investigate a potential security issue. At the bottom here, you activate the Amazon Detective capability within your AWS environment. You automatically distill and organize data, you investigate security findings, and then you discover the root cause. Again, all these are good things because they're helping you get to the root of the issue and hopefully increase your defenses and minimize uh, your overall risk. In this case is explore the behavior to examine disparate actions such as failed logon attempts and suspicious API calls. So this is bringing it all together for those elements that we've outlined. AWS Lambda, I'm calling this out specifically because it, again, it's an event-driven serverless compute platform. Uh, but it's pretty powerful. It allows us to be able to drive uh, specific outcomes. It could be a notification. It could be additional logs. The goal here, again, is to detect, ingest, remediate, uh, and ultimately log. Uh, but you can have the ability to drive outcomes using AWS uh, Lambda as well. So um, here we're going to gather evidence. We're going to contain and, and then eradicate uh, the incident, recover from the incident, and then conduct post-incident activities. Again, all great stuff. And then we've got, you know, centralizing our logs across all these different uh, capabilities. Uh, so we've got CloudTrail, we've got access logs, DNS logs, flow logs, and data is the new gold. We want to do this in the, in, in the security space specifically because then we have an opportunity to run additional analytics against this logging data uh, and drive specific outcomes. Data is the new gold and certainly want as much data as possible, regardless of the cloud service provider that we're leveraging. But then we've got to think about everything else. And so this is a view of the, uh, the uh, environment here. And you can see there's a, quite a bit of components here, right? You've got your inbound uh, virtual private cloud. You might have NAT, you have outbound, which might include proxy servers. You have inspection uh, VPC that might include things like intrusion detection and prevention capabilities. You might even start leveraging, you know, a, uh, a subnet based firewall. You've got flow logs, uh, again, uh, taking and ingesting those logs. You have Route 53 for DNS. You've got AWS Shield, which is your DDoS capabilities. You've got web application firewall. You've got layer three and layer four controls that are stateless, called NACLs. And then you've got security groups, which is L3, L4 control that is stateful within the environment. And so you can see there's quite a bit of pieces. These are pieces that we use in a traditional environment. So there's nothing really new here. The, the benefit, I guess, in cloud service provider is, is that they're part of the services or potentially part of the services that you might purchase with that cloud service provider. Um, and so they're, they're, 
probably pretty easy to turn on and get uh, you know integrated within the fabric of your cloud service instance. But the challenge as we go along, you're, you're going to see that the more you have when it comes into uh, cloud service providers, the instances across different providers, but as well as uh, all the stuff that you have to manage and maintain today uh, outside of the cloud service provider, adds a lot of complexity. You thought I was done with AWS, and in fact, I'm not, right? There's AWS IAM Access Analyzer. This identifies resources in your uh, organization and accounts uh, for like Amazon S3 buckets, IAM roles shared with external entities. This is key, right? Because what we're finding is a lot of these cloud service providers, uh, you, you deploy a service or capability uh, and you may not realize that you actually exposed some of this data um, to the outside world. So we want to make sure that we're not giving unintended access to this uh, data uh, or resources. And we move towards least privileged. And AWS IAM Access Analyzer helps us drive towards that outcome. So set, verify, and refine you know, the access that we're granting these environments. AWS Secrets Manager helps protect credentials and you can use them within your application services and IT. This includes things like rotating and managing, uh, retrieval of database credentials, APIs, and other secrets. And again, there's a whole life cycle that it, AWS Secrets Manager allows you to manage. And so here's an example of uh, AWS Secret Manager and storing API keys, tokens, and other secrets, and then other services that may leverage um, those um, secrets as needed. So more of just-in-time access to those, those credentials. So Amazon Inspector, so we've got guard duty, we've got a detective and now an inspector and many, many other capabilities. But this is an automated vulnerability management service that continually scans those workloads. And really the goal here is, is making sure that we're patching and monitoring any vulnerabilities that exist in our environment. The beauty of, about some of these capabilities is a couple clicks and you're in. Some of them are paid, some of them might be part of the service that you have today. But the goal here is, again, discover and scan these instances, contextualize those findings, uh, feed additional insight into other technologies or capabilities in the security stack, drive specific outcomes, and take action. So the bottom line is there's a lot of capabilities. And with a lot of capabilities comes complexity. And so that's the fear because every organization starts typically with one cloud service provider, we tend to see is, is that even though there's a strong sense of a single cloud service provider, people are looking at cybersecurity resilience uh, and resilience in general, and so they're diversifying, and or there's capabilities that are in other cloud service providers that may give you a competitive advantage, or you do an acquisition, Bottom line is, is that you it, it, you may think that you're going to start with one, but many times you end up with many, and that's where things start getting really interesting. So when we get into Azure, we've got a couple of things that are a little bit different. They call them network security groups versus security groups, network security group logs versus uh, VPC logs uh, or NetFlow or IPFIX data. So again, just some terminology around the naming, but the outcomes are very much the same. But we've got, you know, Microsoft Defender for Cloud, uh, formerly known as Azure Security Center. This helps prevent, detect, and respond with threats, increase visibility, uh, control over your security of your Azure resources. So providing integrated security monitoring, policy management uh, for your subscriptions. The goal here is to help detect threats that may otherwise go unnoticed. And again, work with the broader ecosystem of security solutions and gives you some good insight of what your security posture might look like uh, for an organization. And once you have that, that insight, at least from the Azure perspective at the beginning, maybe you extend this out based on the capabilities that are being offered. But did you already start with AWS? Are you using their capabilities? And do you add this one or do you go back to the other one? Again, some interesting discussion there. Um, never mind the on-premise capability that you might have. Azure Monitor, uh, visualize query route alert, auto scale and automation of the Azure subscription. Uh, so leveraging the activity log and resource log we can have it uh, um, alert on security related events that are generated 
again, you've got your data sources, you've got your data platform, and then you've got the ability to either get additional insight, visualize the data, analyze the data, respond, and, and or integrate. So again, great capabilities. Data is the new gold. I said that earlier. I'm going to say it again. The problem that I see and that we're seeing in the industry is, is what capability are you driving from which cloud service provider? Or are you? Uh, are you looking to uh, have something that's a little bit more agnostic that can reach uh, the entire multi IT environment, including all the cloud service providers, your traditional environments, and maybe even extend beyond that to things like SaaS and hybrid work and all the other components. Azure Advisor is a personalized cloud consultant. This is great. You can't have enough uh, consultants, uh, but it analyzes your resource configuration, your usage telemetry, tells you how much you're going to spend. The benefit here is really it helps with security as well. So it, it gives you some recommendations around high impact or medium impact or low impact elements that you could address um, in your cloud environment uh, and make it more secure. So again, a good thing, but we've got the advisor and we've got you know a, a bunch of the AWS components, etc. So I think you get the idea here. And then you've got SIM um, and, and uh, SOAR, so uh, you know, orchestration, automation, and response. Um, Azure has a capability certainly here to help with threat hunting and threat visibility and threat response. These are all good things, good capabilities that they're providing uh, customers and that can extend beyond the Microsoft framework, which then allows things like playbooks where you can take an event, create a record, maybe even post a message, send an email. Uh, that's all good stuff uh, because you want to automate as much as possible there as you can, but then you may want to drive specific outcomes. And so in this case, based on the event that was triggered, you may want to then block the user in uh, Azure, maybe the external IP address of that compromised user that was using that username and password nefariously in the organization, maybe you want to block that IP on a next generation uh, platform. And you've got your virtual network, you've got your network security groups, you've got your network ACLs, you've got your web application firewalls, you've got your Windows Defender, your Azure DDoS, firewall, uh, Azure multi-factor authentication, and there's a lot more. I just don't have enough time to go through it. They have a ton of capabilities in comparison to any other cloud service provider and even more perhaps. The bottom line is, is that it does highlight the complexity that comes with all of these cloud service providers and all the nuances between each one of them and how they might do things. That adds complexity and complexity is not the friend of security. And so we're not done because we didn't just walk away from the traditional data center. That still exists. And in a traditional data center, you've got ne next generation IPS and firewalling, you got flow logs, you, you might already have an investment in SIM, you've got network access control, you've got uh, you know your own identity here, you've got advanced malware inspection, and it goes on, vulnerability management, application control, virtual instances, containers, patch management, web application firewall, enterprise DDoS, you got forensics and malware sandboxing, you know, and it goes on. And so there's a skill set that's already being created within this environment. Most likely, a lot of these capabilities, you've got a, an operational process that supports it, as well as the skill sets to manage it. And, um, and, and so there's some something to be said about that. That's a skill set that's already obtained. And so there may or may not be an opportunity to extend capabilities to drive very similar or maybe, maybe even better outcomes within the cloud service provider or vice versa. Maybe that control or capability is out of that cloud service provider and you're going to extend it across the stack of capabilities that you're offering your customers and, and uh, business partners. Bottom line is a ton of complexity. Uh, and so from an adversarial perspective, you have to think that they have an advantage here. So let's walk through this and really break this up and highlight perhaps some of the complexity. Now we leverage the same capability across the stack versus having an independent capability. I think if you think about it that way, it's still tremendously complex in comparison 
but then you add in multi-vendor and it becomes very, very messy. But let's just walk through this and, and, and see if it resonates. So we've got, you know, you work from home, work from anywhere, branch office and main office, and all of them have specific nuances. Then you've got your public cloud, your private cloud, you might have internet based access, and then that comes with some SaaS based services. And then on the other end, you have some, some service that you're offering that, that are sanctioned based applications. Then you have private cloud to public cloud. So there's some, some direct connect or express route or VPN connectivity tying the two environments together. And then you've got your single cloud service provider or multi-cloud service provider. And so this is, you know, in essence, a multi-IT environment with a tr tremendous amount of complexity uh, for defenders to secure it. We've got threat intelligence. This has to be key and it has to stretch across all of these capabilities. That's something that we've got to keep in mind constantly. We want to make sure incident res response considers the big picture, not just components within the environment. And then you need detection response, regardless of the investments you make defending the organization, nothing's going to prevent 100% of every threat that happens. And so some are going to be realized and therefore we need the ability to detect things that look odd, that may not have been determined as threat and then ultimately be able to respond to them. And then drive out things like prioritization, investigation, orchestration, and automation. All right, so endpoint protection, detection, and response, right? That's key component. You're gonna have that on your endpoint, your, your, your user assets, but you're also gonna have this potentially in your data center and your private cloud and your, and your cloud service provider. And again, if you're assuming that you bought this and leveraged the, a single vendor, uh, a little less complexity here, but imagine if you are looking at different vendors providing different services in each one, and they all have, again, their nuances, they all might provide great capabilities, uh, but operationally, uh, certainly challenging. Then internet-based controls. So think about DNS and web-based or proxy-based controls. Uh, you know, zero trust network access seems to come in here. You've got cloud-delivered firewall. You've got next generation intrusion prevention detection capabilities. You've got data loss prevention. You've got uh, remote browser isolation. So this is really the ability to uh, take um, high-valued targeted individuals and never have their browser render on their endpoint. This browser is rendered in the cloud and therefore as an adversary, if I'm looking for an exploit and running it against that uh, browser or asset that connected to my malicious service, I'm actually never directly impacting the end user asset. And so there's layers of protection there uh, inherently because the browser is not connected to the asset the user is actually connected from. Then you get into next gen firewall. You're gonna have this in your branch office, your main office, your private cloud. You're gonna have it in your cloud service provider. I suspect many of the capabilities that are driven in cloud aren't including things like intrusion prevention, advanced malware protection, the ability to um, understand the hosts and the risks involved with those hosts uh, based on the threat that's uh, tempting or being realized at the time. And so there's context that's uh, that's centered around that. And so these are, are you know typically pretty important. And then if you look at traditional environments, they, they, they've moved from an L3, L4 based control to a, a, you know an application focused uh, based outcome. Uh, that's wrapped around user identity and all that other good stuff that comes with the, the label of next generation firewall. Then you get into cyber asset and attack surface management and cloud security posture management. So this is now having the ability to extend across that multi-cloud environment uh, and understand how you sit from a compliance perspective or what assets are accessible externally, like an open S3 bucket that is not intended to be opened and anything that ties into that. So, you know, there could be an asset that connects to an S3 bucket that the S3 bucket is private, but the asset or EC2 instance or VM um, is in fact uh has access and externally accessible. And so having a good understanding of where you sit from a posture perspective, but also an attack surface perspective, you can then start mitigating risk. The goal here though, is making sure that we can do this across the multi-cloud environment. 
vulnerability risk. Again, you've got your assets that are user-based and then you've got your workloads that are in the cloud environment, whether that be private cloud, uh, your Azure, AWS, uh, Google instance. But again, if you have different capabilities driving different outcomes from each one of these, you can see where the complexity certainly comes in. Securing the workload. So having the ability to build host-based controls and, and more of an application-centric type outcome uh, is critically important. And, um, and, and again, it helps drive towards zero trust. Remember, zero trust is not a single product or capability. It's a framework of capabilities that drive an outcome. And zero trust is the outcome that we desire, but there's a bunch of complementing capabilities to ensure that assets being connected have the minimal access required. And if anything changes within those dispositions, uh, we certainly want to revoke access at any point in time. So again, understanding the applications and how it communicates on the network allows us then to build host-based controls dynamically and then tune them if needed and leverage the uh, capabilities driven on the workload to secure all processes and applications making connections. Then we go into uh, secure application and then we get into uh, continuous integration and continuous uh, delivery or deployment. So CI, CD type outcomes, right? This is really focused on DevOps and making sure that the code as it's moving through that process is in fact secure, but also building in controls as needed uh, for those applications and driving those outcomes. Remote access VPN, that's not going to go away whether or not you drive 80, 90% of your workforce to something like zero trust network access and, and use native TLS based applications and, and be able to posture and profile and understand assets before they connect to it. There's still a need for remote access VPN for certain use cases. And so that may still exist in the environment. And then you have VPN or traditional VPN where, you know, your main office and your branch office and your your main office to uh, your cloud service provider or private cloud, uh, you may be using commodity-based internet uh, type connectivity, but even if you're running it, you know, something like an MPLS uh, connection or direct connect, uh, there's still maybe reasons why you'd want to run your own encryption on top of that in case the provider environment does get compromised, even if it is or sounds pretty remote. Um, that said, VPN, again, is going to be deployed across the fabric of capabilities that you have. Then you get into cloud access security broker, and this is now looking at your sanction-based applications and identifying you know, how they're being used, kind of correlating that someone connected to Office 365 from Canada, uh, for example, and then within 15 minutes, access box from another uh, country or continent. Um, and therefore, um, you know, they're both disparate SaaS based service providers um, and how, how you're going to tie that together is something like a cloud access security broker. So you can see that, you know, you can't travel that fast to get to that other location. And therefore, there's a high level of risk that the user uh, name and password has been compromised. And certainly ways of, of further mitigating that. But also things like DLP and making sure the sanction application um, data that's being sent into these cloud environments is the data that you want to go there and it's being shared with the, the people that you want it shared with. Now we're in the in the SaaS based environment. So this is different than, you know, next gen firewall with malware capabilities or web proxy with capabilities or uh, your endpoint uh, detection response that drives uh, malware uh, prevention and capabilities. This is really about uh, using an API to scan and scour your, your file repositories in the cloud, as an example, and looking for malware. And a lot of the vendors or SaaS-based services will have their own capability, but you may not have the same level of visibility into that. And so this gives you an opportunity to start tying this together. Again, I mentioned we want to centralize, if we can, DNS-based logging. Uh, regardless of where you're connected, flow data, you want your samples as an example. It's ideally, if you can get them centralized, it makes life a lot easier if there is ever an incident and you need to get access to the data. Email security, I'm calling this out specifically because there's tremendous risk here. Um, network detection response. So this goes all the way back to, you know, when a connection is made, 
uh, reaches the the application or process reaches outbound creates a network connection or activity you want to be able to capture that and so having it in some places and not other is may not give you full visibility so whether you're at the branch office or at home or uh, main office you want to grab that ip fix data netflow jflow sflow vpc flow logs in your cloud service provider your nsg flow logs and centralize them Multi-factor authentication, again, making sure that we have multi-factor authentication, not only for the applications that we're accessing from a, a traditional user community, but things like SSH. Uh, you're an administrator that needs to SSH into an instance that's an appliance that's physically located in the branch office. We want to make sure that we're looking at multi-factor authentication for all use cases, not specific applications, and uh, providing that capability and ensuring that we're removing the risk. In the campus, we get things like 802.1x around wired and, and wireless and making sure that we understand the assets. Again, a, a driving towards a zero trust outcome, all of these elements uh, start to complement one another, driving towards that, give guest act access and making sure that even VPN, you've got a central authority, regardless of how a user connects to the environment, help streamline, again, your understanding of how something might get into the environment and where it might have went since it got in the environment, because now I've centralized all of that uh, insight into one platform. You've got DDoS, a web application, so you've got enterprise DDoS protecting your services that you may uh, still be offering using an on-premise type delivery mechanism and or your cloud service provider has the ability to add additional mitigations around DDoS and web application firewalling as well. So something to consider. And then the human firewall, I just want to add that because all of this doesn't matter if we can't improve the user community in regards to their understanding of risk um, and use them as part of our defense. And so I'm just calling out human firewall is certainly a significant element to the equation. And then finally, decrypt. And I, I left this to the last specifically because it doesn't matter what I'm doing for many of these controls if I don't have the ability to either decrypt the traffic or run some type of analysis against traffic like flow logs that gives me insight into nefarious activities that might be taking place. You can't run uh, intrusion detection uh, or prevention against an encrypted payload if you can't see the payload. So you might be able to do the outer side of that encrypted channel, but what's most important is, is, is that a as simple as a SQL injection inside that TLS-based payload that I don't have visibility into? And you might say, well, I've got endpoint protection, so I'll catch it there, and it's in clear text on the endpoint. Listen, if we're protecting at the endpoint, you, you better be 100% correct every single time because if you're not, you are compromised at that point. There's no other defensive mechanism that's going to help you at that stage, right? It's already too late. So we want to make sure that we're preventing and mitigating risks as far away from the asset as possible, because that gives us a chance when those controls fails to, to catch it as it gets closer to the asset. Endpoint prevention and detection and response type capabilities are there as a fail safe. That's the way we should be thinking anyway. All right, so you can see it's complex. We've got Azure, we've got AWS, and we've got our traditional environment, and then all the other environments, microservices, just-in-time delivery of services. That's a big challenge for us, right? These things come up, and then they disappear very, very quickly. And um, as defenders, um, if we're not, uh, you know, resident somewhere along the line there, it's going to be very, very difficult to know what might have happened, uh, never mind preventing it. So a lot of questions start to come up or, or, or that you want to consider, right? How do I centralize visibility? Do I have the right protections in place? How do I manage all of these controls? How do I consume threat intelligence? Do I cover detect, prevent, and response capabilities? How do I hunt for threats? What about orchestration and automation? Can I build playbooks? And what about incident response? And it goes on, right? Everyone does it different, so how do I become proficient? in all of these different um, uh, ways of driving outcomes. And then do I really understand the attack surface? There's a ton of complexity here. And so it, it makes it very, very difficult, not only to defend 
in these environments, but also understand what happens when a compromise is realized. So let's look at an example here. We've got AWS environment and we've got, let's say guard duty uh, enabled here. We've got our adversary knocks on the front door and it's blocked. So not a big deal. We mitigate risk and we block it. Um, and then we've got a traditional data center and that same adversary might try to knock on that door. And we've got a flow collector and the flow collector is looking at telemetry data. Again, I'm, I'm just trying to keep it simple here. And knocks on the front door and it gets blocked. So not a big deal. We've got two blocks. And so the first question has got to be is how did I, can I tie these, these uh, two attempted uh, attacks? Can I correlate that to a, a, a single adversary? Maybe, maybe not. But what if they had a, the ability to start up an EC2 instance within the environment? So they bypass that internet gateway or control because maybe they've harvested a credential and they've got access, whether it, through direct API or through the portal, but they have access and they start up an EC2 instance. So this is a VM and now it's used as a jump host. Now they're in the environment. And so there might be an alert that an EC2 instance started, and there's lots of capabilities that can help alert you to that. Um, but does it get missed in all the other alerts? Again, I don't know, but these are things that you want to think about. Then they move from a public segment to a private segment within the environment. They see a VPN head end, maybe it's a direct connect, whatever it might be. Um, and there's another environment. And so again, maybe there's an alert and the VPC log is triggered, right? The, or at least we have the VPC logs in this particular case. So that's a good thing. We've got the logging data, but do we know about it? Well, I don't know, right? So the adversary continues to move along and there's a services farm that they access uh, in that traditional data center. And they see another VPN, flow logs are generated and there's another uh, connection to another cloud service provider. And again, it'll have very similar stuff. I'm running out of real estate here, but maybe there's a services farm here. And again, NSG logs is triggered. And, and in this case, we have network watcher that's on the Azure side. So we've got you know guard duty that's capturing VPC logs. We've got our flow collector internally that's capturing VPC logs. We've got NSG logs that are being captured by our, our um, network watcher but they're all disparate and run on their own. So the data might exist. And then we've got the CC2 instance that was started at the beginning that probably resides somewhere within um, the AWS environment, like CloudTrail. And so um, now we've got, you know, a potentially an alert um, in EC2 that, you know, is guard duty and CloudTrail. We've got flow logs that potentially has alert on the flow collector within the on-premise environment. And then we've got some NSG logs that have been captured by Network Watcher. Now this is us, right? How did we, or how are we going to go about tying this all together? How do we know that this is part of the, the same attack? This isn't multiple adversaries. This is a single adversary that's been able to pivot and move within the environment using access through the portal or the API, bypassing many of the controls that may exist in the environment um, originally, and has made their way through all these different environments um, and, and perhaps you know, triggering some types of a, an event, maybe not even an alarm, and that data is stored. How do we pull it all together? So it becomes very, very difficult. And from an adversary's perspective, they see this as complexity and, and certainly an opportunity. So what do we do? How do we take a step back and understand this? And I love doing this, right? Is, is that maybe you take a step back and forget about potentially where the uh, service might reside. Although it, there could be value in doing so. So you could have this particular stream, for example, broken out and you might say AWS, Azure, and this is traditional because you have maybe e-commerce in each one or have them as independent flows. But the bottom line is, is that when I take a step back and say customer browsing prices to e-commerce web application, I got application workloads that download uh, updates from their update servers. I've got front end web servers that talk to back end 
I've got application engines that talk to database zones, and then I've got DevOps that uh, you know need access to the management zone. When I do that, I can then start looking at the attack surface, and again understand the you know the uh, the risks to that particular flow. And so if you think about this, and this is just an example, it's not a comprehensive list of attacks. But it gives you, uh, if you if you take a, a hacker slash auditor kind of mindset to this, you can then start placing some of the, th the risks that are associated to this specific flow. And you do that for each one of them. And they might look the same in some cases. Um, you'll see a pattern where there's a common capability that's required across the stack. But you will pick up some of the nuances and identify them as potential gaps but certainly risks that may need addressing. And again, maybe a control that you have investment in can satisfy that, uh, or maybe it's it's time to go to market for something that can do that. But you want to think about this holistically. So if you have to go to market, for example, for flow analytics, maybe you want to make sure that it can work with VPC flow logs and NSG flow logs and IP fix data and net flow and all the other flows that come with it. Why? Well, because you have an opportunity maybe to have a centralized platform that can take that telemetry data in and make sense of the big picture versus uh, pieces of the environment that's fragmented. And then you start adding your defensive capabilities. These are the defensive elements that are going to help mitigate the risks that I just previously identified. And you can see now I've got this this almost storyboard approach to mitigating risk as opposed to giving an executive I need a next gen firewall a web application firewall and it's going to cost you know three million dollars now you can come back and say look at this is what we've done we've taken our critical flows we've understand the nuances between all these different environments we've calculated the risk for each one of the flows we've built out our defensive capabilities we have investments in four of them already so we've got good controls three of them we need to expand from maybe our traditional environment because there is a cloud offering from that vendor today that can drive that outcome in our cloud service providers and so we're going to do that but we do have some gaps where we have to go to market and these are them very very different conversation and so now, as I mentioned, you start looking at DNS and maybe web, and you see about how you can have the same type of control and capability and build your skill sets internally, you know, where they're not having to manage all these disparate capabilities with all these different nuances. Now you have somebody that building a skill set uh, across the stack because it's the same skill set and the same platform driving that outcome. Firewalling, VPN, IPS malware, right? These are things that you can start thinking about. Can I do NSG and, and uh, my security groups and firewalling and VPN? Flow analytics, again, NSG, flow logs, VPC flow logs. Multi-factor authentication, application segmentation, endpoint detection and response, and endpoint prevention. You got DDoS and web application. So it just gives you an idea. Again, this is not meant to be comprehensive in every single control, but these are certainly some of the core ones that many organizations consider uh, table stake items. And again, you want to make sure you're thinking about all the other uh, complexities uh, that might be introduced here. So ex for example, if you have application segmentation and driving outcomes on a physical and, and virtual assets, can it also support microservices? Um, and it, if it can't, then you've got a gap or may need to go to market. If it can, fantastic, right? Then you want to make sure that you're doing something around vulnerability asset and mitigation. Again, making sure that that stretches across the entire stack. And then each one of these though, and I don't want to ignore this, each one of these has their own requirements. So again, at a high level bucket, you might need endpoint prevention, detection, response. But in reality, these are some of the things that you want in an endpoint. You want to look at it from a uh, prevention perspective, the blue, and then uh, detect and respond green at the bottom and work through. Like if I can buy an endpoint protection or detection and response platform, uh, these are some of the things I want. You may not get them all, you may, but the, the bottom line is, is that you want to reduce complexity. And so when you go to market, you want to make sure that you're looking at the capabilities that each one of these 
um, controls provide and really understand the potential. And then APIs, APIs all day, every day, right? The advanced CLI, but the programmatic way of driving outcomes is critically important, especially in cloud service providers, but it, as well as traditional environments. Uh, APIs are critically important, and so you want to make sure that they exist. I'd say that most, uh, you know, vendors today are certainly building strong API capability. So you get extended detection and response. You want orchestration, automation, playbooks, threat hunting, insert response. All of these are going to be elements that you're going to drive towards for every capability that uh, you add. And so you got to make sure that you're understanding any of the complexities and nuances here um, as well. And then threat intelligence and intelligence sources. Again, you want to feed that in, in, in the entire fabric of everything that you do. So in summary, it's, it's complex. You might think you're turning on a couple of things and you're good to go, but managing and operating that long term. And then as you start expanding out, it's tough. So there's a lot of great capabilities within cloud service provider, much better than traditional environments right out of the gate. Securing cloud can get complex very, very quickly. And so you want to make sure that you understand that. You want to understand the executive drivers, threats and risks to the business and understand those business flows because they're key in determining what is required. You want to build the security for the cloud with open mindset. Consider the bigger picture. It's more than a single cloud. And if you take that approach, I think you're going to be better served. I'm not suggesting not to use the capabilities within the cloud service provider, but just understand the capabilities, any potential limitations or nuance within that environment and address them accordingly. You want to build in cloud security tools or built in cloud security tools may be limited. Uh, and fragmentation does exist. And you got to think about private, public, hybrid, SaaS, all the different uh, environments that you're protecting. APIs drive programmatic outcomes. It's going to fuel orchestration automation, allow you to build those workflows and reduce time to respond. You want to consider all aspects of detection, prevention, and response when building out security solutions. And participation from all teams. So when you're going through this process, think network, security, cloud, audit, application, endpoint. All of them have value in this discussion uh, or can add value to this discussion. And so it's critically important to think about these other teams as you're building this out because they may impact them one way or another. And even think about risk and audit, even procurement. All of them have vested interest in the outcomes that you deliver when looking at simplifying and building out your overall security platform. So hopefully the adversary at this point is not liking us or we've made it very, very difficult that they're triggering enough events that uh, or alerts uh, and uh, they're running up against walls constantly that they're never able to make their way in. Forecast will continue to call for cloudy weather.